So good afternoon and thank you very much in this weather coming for a lecture. <laughs> we are really very, very grateful. And uh, this is a great pleasure for me to introduce uh, our geopolitical talks, which became one of uh, the tradition uh, uh, of the Institute, uh, having uh, four lectures uh, every year which we are organizing together with the Austrian Ministry of Defense. And the major idea of this series always was to try to give a kind of a bigger picture and to try to enter both academic and political debate here for different uh, perspective on what's going on. It turned out that people who are coming and giving this lecture, this lecture was very good for their career. Uh, after, after giving a lecture, Bill Burns became the head of the American intelligence. Thomas Bagger, whom probably some of you have uh, recently uh, listening to from July is becoming the State Secretary for the German Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, after giving the talk here, Jim O'Brien was immediately basically <laughs> suggested to become the Assistant Secretary for Europe. So I don't know where Comfort is going to end up after this talk. Uh, but this is a really great, uh, uh, great privilege for me uh, to introduce uh, Comfort Aero. And I'm going to tell you exactly why. She is the president of the International Crisis Group Probably some of you know the organizations, probably not. But starting 1993, 94, 95, a group of uh, American Europeans were very much kind of desperate about the situation and how the international uh, community was reacting to the crisis in Bosnia. And having somebody here who knows about Bosnia more than uh, all of us together, basically they decided that there is need for an organization that based on the really understanding what is happening on the ground uh, can come with the policies to try to prevent war and conflicts. And this was kind of a moment in which the idea of the international community sounded slightly more <laughs> convincing uh, than now. And then immediately it was not only about Bosnia. The first impulse was Bosnia, but then you have Rwanda, uh, you have Somalia and so on. And the idea was that something is going wrong. And part of the this that is going wrong was that there was not enough information about what is really happening on the ground. And then uh, was ICG basically had been set and many uh, famous people have been related to the organizations running it or staying on its board, but with the passing of time, the organization really developed a huge capacity uh, to be on the ground. All of the reports that they're doing are based on the people that have been standing in the places where they're reporting on. This is the major differences. And they're following conflicts which we all try to forget. In a certain way, they became very much specialized on the frozen conflicts. In a certain way, when conflict is up in the air, everybody is interested, and then in three or four years, nobody remember what it was about. And this was the difference. International crisis group are going to stay, basically, and follow and try to understand what was going on. Uh, and of course, one of the most important places of all this was Africa. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, Comfort was uh, born in London, but in fact she is Nigerian with Nigerian parents, and her parents uh, took a decision for which, being Bulgarian, I have a very uh, strong fascination. They decided to send her back, so in her early years, to be socialized in her own country. They wanted for her to know what it means to be Nigerian. It was a tough time. You can imagine, basically, the country was just coming after the uh, anti-colonial wars and so on. So nevertheless, that she after that was educated in the United Kingdom and she has her PhD from the London School of Economics and so on. Uh, she really basically was very much socialized in the environment of a country which was in a big turmoil. And then she started with ICG, and then the UN basically have stolen it uh, <laughs> from ICG, and she was uh, the person basically in charge of the peacekeeping in Liberia. So she has all this kind of a perspective from a how the international institutions work, how those who basically are unhappy how the international institutions work react, and also what is the role of a certain type of a knowledge and advocacy. And uh, starting with uh, 2021, December, 
She became, before she was the acting president, she became the president of uh, ICG. So obviously the ICG was expecting what is going to happen to, uh, in Ukraine. So they <laughs> we needed a kind of a strong president. And I'm saying this because, and I'm going to end on this, the fact that she's here for me is very important because she has one perspective that most of us, and particularly it's true for us East Europeans, quite often lack. When you are covering at one and the same time 10 or 12 crises in the world, you know one thing. Participants in every of these crises know that their crisis probably is the most important, that all of them has a global consequences, and quite often they're judging the global actors on the way they respond to their crisis. So uh, when uh, basically Comfort published a very influential article in foreign policy trying to explain why some of the non-Western countries uh, so differently reacted <coughs> to the Russian aggression in Ukraine than Europeans and Americans, I decided that particularly for a place like us, which is so much rooted in Eastern Europe, and which for us basically this war is kind of a defining in a, ma uh, in a major way, having your perspective and having your story is going to be of a great importance. So thank you so much. You. Uh, she's going to make a presentation. I'm going to ask after that three or four questions. Then we're going to go for your questions. And thank you again for being with us. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much, uh, Ivan, for your really kind uh, words. And it's really nice to be able to get uh, a good crowd on a very beautiful um, evening in, in Vienna. I haven't been to Vienna um, since last year when we, I came to the OSF uh, yeah. board meeting as well. But even before then, the last time I came to Vienna was when I was a, a student um, studying actually on European security. And I came via Vienna to go to Sarajevo um, to go and see a, a friend of mine who was working for the OSCE at the time. And Sarajevo was, was one of the, and the, the war in former Yugoslavia was very much what formed my thinking of international peace and security along with the end of apartheid in South Africa and then um, the genocide in Rwanda. And that was, those are the defining moments for me alongside with um, my parents' birthplace and the story for why they had to leave um, Nigeria was because, or why they couldn't return to Nigeria, because they came to the UK in the 1960s and they found each other um, in London in 1960s. Um, but their parents told them not to come back home because of the civil war. And they felt that um, they wanted one of their children to stay outside to help the others who were going to eventually um, come um, as refugees um, to stay in other parts of, of the world. And so I think my parents' story, the timing in which I was a student at the end of, of the, the pulling down of the wall in Berlin um, and the end of the Cold War were really instrumental and sort of explained the reason why I, in the end, chose an organisation like Crisis Group, because I never wanted to be told that I couldn't go home or go to my parents' birthplace and I wanted to think about ways in which to um, end conflicts or at least prevent it or understand how to rebuild countries um, that have torn themselves apart outside of civil war as well. So that's partly why I chose Crisis Group and uh, I chose the United Nations. Um, and then eventually I chose another type of career um, around transitional justice and how to deal with that dilemma of peace and justice and how you deal with accountability um, for, for crimes and crimes against humanity. Um, after civil wars or other kind of, of violations against um, human beings as well. Um, so I'm really grateful um, that Ivan <laughs> asked me and Ivan um, mentioned the foreign policy um, piece. You know, when crisis group, when the war started on the, the 24th of February, we were quick to remind people that the war didn't actually start on the 24th of February 2022. It started long before that in Crimea um, in, 2020, in 2014. Um, and that this was one long war and there wasn't some kind of different war, but the 24th of February was a continuation of a long war. And Crisis Group, and I don't wear it as a badge of honour and I don't go around saying it um, proudly, but because Crisis Group is an early warning organisation, because our job is about warning early and trying to get you know, international actors to think early, 
we warned that there was going to be some kind of misadventure, some kind of war um, by President Putin um, and, his, um, um, and his team. The, the nature of that war, how long it would last, um, we couldn't tell. But, there but we sensed at the beginning of, of, of January 2022 that there was going to be something. In fact, in December 2021, um, we'd already put out a, a briefing, a, lo a long briefing that explained the potential um, for war and the, the possible scope for Europe and the United States and others to act and other deterrents, but also finding a way to come to the table. Um, but we were very clear um, by the end of December that we, we saw all the trend lines um, to war. And we were, we were very clear and we called it and said, look, there's going to be one kind of war. What we didn't bank on and what we didn't expect, and I think a number of people didn't expect that, was the degree of resilience that you would see from the people of Ukraine. The other thing that we weren't certain about um, was the kind of unity um, and coming together um, from the United States and Europe, that there would be some kind of coherence. Um, largely, I think, um, to be credited to um, President Biden, who himself um, was very much um, a, sort of a warrior from the Cold War period and had a clear sense um, of history and probably saw certain trend lines himself, which is partly explains why America was very forward-leaning in the intelligence that it shared um, with a number of European countries. A number of people, um, European leaders, didn't necessarily believe in the intelligence, partly also as a consequence of the US um, role in the Iraq um, war. So I just wanted to explain um, that history um, to you and sort of crisis group's role. And we've accompanied the war in Ukraine from its inception in 2014 and the invasion thereafter. And one of the things that I'm really glad, and it speaks to Crisis Group, and Ivan mentioned it as a trustee and he knows us very well, is that we're never about one single conflict. Our work is global. And while Ukraine was going on, we were watching other trend lines. And even before Ukraine, the world looked really terrible. The, the trend lines towards, towards war was already going in the wrong direction. Um, the headlines in 2021 was about U um, Ethiopia. And also in 2022, um, among the worst conflicts that we saw in 2022 was in fact e the Ethiopian war. And this year, um, we have another um, war that's taken place with a company in Ukraine, it's in, in Sudan. And neither of these conflicts captured the same headlines as, as Ukraine. There are good reasons for that. There are also worrying reasons um, for that. And for that reason, it's, crisis, it's why Crisis Group exists, to make sure that we keep on the headlines, not the ones that are in the media, captured by, by the media, but the ones that are below the radar, forgotten conflicts, or the ones that don't capture the same imaginations for various reasons, either the geopol geopolitics, but also what's driving those conflicts and the interest of a number of countries as well. And in that sense also, what I want to sort of discuss with you today is the world in which we're living in and the state of the crises that we're dealing with. And there's a sense in which, you know, the media focuses on one headline and we go beh be below the headline to tell you that there's a multitude of crises and we need to be worried, not just because of one crisis, but because of, of the tsunami of problems in which our world is facing um, today. So in the aftermath of Russia's in, um, invasion um, last year, we saw you know, that how it brought sort of considerable um, upheaval, um, how it posed a number of questions, um, not only about the global order, but also about the European security architecture and the two countries that have sort of defined that architecture, on the one hand, Russia, and on the, on the, on the other hand, United States as well. But we also saw how this invasion, um, the global fallout of the invasion, and we saw how it triggered, and it is triggering, a period of increased assertiveness by reg regional powers, middle powers, to borrow the term that you defined and you started to define last year. And we saw how this presented and is presenting an increasing challenge to the international peace and security architecture as well. And we're seeing a lot of turbulence today, um, a lot of upheaval as a result of Ukraine. 
But at the same time, the world was already going in the wrong direction before Ukraine, and the world has worsened as a, as a consequence of the invasion um, in Ukraine. Uh, what I want to do in the 35 minutes that I have um, with you to speak, I want to step back a little bit and look at the wider global picture um, that, that we've seen and the changes that are taking place um, as, as we speak. And there are two themes that I want to sort of put forward to you um, this evening. Um, one theme is around the poly crisis, and then another theme is around sort of a polycentric respond um, to that crisis that we're seeing as well. The international system today that we're living in is going through what you will be familiar with um, because you know him very well, Ivan, um, is what is called or defined um, by a historian um, in the UK, um, Adam Toos, what he calls a poly crisis. Um, and the way in which to understand the poly crisis is to understand it as a series um, of global um, issues that are coinciding at the same time and then operating side by si side simultaneously. So on the eve of Ukraine, you already had a, um, a world coming out of the COVID-19 pandemic. You also had climate um, change happening as well. And you already, already had tensions that were unfolding, um, polarization in a number of different parts um, of the world. And you also had inflation as a result of the COVID-19. You already had food insecurity at the same time. And all these shocks have come to intersect at a time of darkening geopolitical, uh, a darkening geopolitical picture. And then the second theme that I want to focus on in my conversation is that in facing this poly crisis that we see, this um, sort of cacophony of, of crisis that are interweaving and intersecting at the same time, in facing this poly crisis, we've come to in rely increasingly on what we define within crisis group as a polycentric um, system to handle the convergence and the compounding challenges that we're seeing in the international landscape. What we're seeing also at the same time is that power is growing more diffuse um, among states. Normally we would go to the United States to look for a solution or would go to the European Union to look for a solution. And what we've seen is that power now across all the institutions is diffuse and it's very hard to understand where the center of gravity is in which to deal with a number of crises as well. We've seen in the last few years a proliferation of international decision makers, decision centers, whether it's a G7 that's just finished now, or the G20, the United Nations, the EU, international financial institutions, all of them coming together, but not neatly coming together to grapple with all these crises that we're dealing with as well. And it comes at the same time as we see a P5 country in the form of Russia intervene, usurping one of the most fundamental pi pillars, the architectures of the United Nations Charter, um, which is then to undermine the sovereignty and the territorial integrity of another country as well. It's not a new observation that we have multitude of different institutions um, designed um, to deal with um, different crises that we're seeing around the world. But what is very clear also is that the one institution that ought to be driving, shaping, defining how to respond on these issues, the United Nations Security Council, for instance, finds itself at a moment where it is not necessarily seen as the most legitimate actor to resolve these crises. Why? Because one of the aggressors of the war is a member of the P5, Russia. And a number of people, and you'll remember, Ivan, you met him yourself, um, a number of people have also responded and said, well, it's not just the Russia who was an aggressor historically. We also have another country in the, in the chambers of the P5, America, and a number of people cite what uh, America did vis-a-vis -vis, um, Iraq back in 2003. It's also not lost on a number of people that 20 year, um, the anniversary of the invasion or the, of the intervention of the US in Iraq sort of coincided um, with Russia's own, um, Russia's own in inv invasion into Ukraine as well. I think what is also significant um, in looking at the polycentric um, theme, but also the polycentric um, crisis also, is that increasingly amongst us, we're seeing the marginali marginalization of a number of crises as well, because a number of these institutions do not necessarily have the bandwidth 
to deal with a multitude of crises in front of them as well. So first on the, the poly crisis and what exactly we mean um, by the poly crisis. I think it's a reality today that there's just, just a multitude of things that we have to challenge and a number of things have occurred in the last three years um, that should give us pause for concern. First is the way in which the pandemic shut down the economy and it shut down the global economy of the, of the country for nearly three years and China only just emerging out of that crisis as well. At the same time, we've seen a worsening of climate change just look at the picture that was coming out of Pakistan in the last year or so with the flooding across that country and a competition um, for resources um, in a number of poor countries as well. And at the same time, a war in Europe and how that war in Europe was disrupting food, fertilizer and energy supplies, not just in Europe, where the immediacy of the conflict was very apparent, but beyond Europe in places like Latin America, in Africa and in Asia. It also explains why a number of countries took the position that they've taken um, in Ukraine because of the impact and the fallout of the Ukrainian crisis or the response of Europe and the United States towards um, Russia's invasion and what it meant for a number of countries beyond um, Europe as well. And this was also happening at the time when we saw a surge in inflation, which was further testing a number of already weak economies, a number of countries that are already low, um, poor income countries already suffering um, from poverty as well. You add Ukraine to that and you see why a number of countries took a slightly different position in their, in their response um, to Ukraine as well. And I think one of the countries, um, Ivan, that I think um, becomes an unfortunate poster child for the poly crisis, for example, that, it, that is not in the headline in the way it used to be, is, for example, is Lebanon. And here you see not only the effects of COVID-19, you saw inflation, you saw the global food crisis had created the conditions which crisis <coughs> group doesn't use very easily, but we, we turn to that label when we see a, cri a country facing a combination of these crises. Today, Lebanon is what you would describe as a state in collapse as well. And this was happening on the eve of Ukraine and has worsened um, post-Ukraine, um, not because of Ukraine, but because of the fallout, because of the state of the world as the time that Ukraine was taking place as well. Another country that was in a state of disarray before Ukraine and its conditions has worsened as a result um, of the global fallout as well is Sri Lanka. And there you see rampant inflation, a debt default, and that led to protest and a fall of the government as well. And of course, these cases are unique in themselves. Um, and our own assessment is that it's these economic crises and associated political crises that are not random one-offs, but we suspect, we predict, because we're an early warning um, organization, that you're going to see more and more of these economic kind of crises coupled with political crisis and an age where the international community, the international systems, the institutions that are supposed to respond to these crises are unable to because they don't have the bandwidth and because their own domestic constituencies are facing a series of poly crises as well. <coughs> Ivan, you talked about the fact that I was from the United Kingdom as well, and this is a country that is facing its own domestic pressures as well. And you look in the United States, these are countries that are not only facing economic crisis, but also are heavily polarized as well. And so they're being asked to deal with a combination of crises in Ukraine, the after, the after Russia's invasion, but also to deal with a list of other crises beyond their, beyond their borders as well. So what we predict um, coming forward um, this year, and it was already featured quite clearly by the IMF and the World Bank as well this year, was that we predict that we're going to see more economic turbulence throughout 2023 and into 2024. We also predict a period of widespread unrest in a number of countries, not just low income countries, but even some middle, um, middle ranking um, economies as well, whether in Latin America, in Asia, or, or even in Africa, and even in Europe as well, where Europe has borne and seen the pain of the fallout from, from Ukraine as well. And some of those states that we were watching last year that we 
saw avert or were able to avert or delay any kind of crisis, we suspect that those countries are going to face um, turbulence. I'm, de not, I'm deliberately not naming those countries, um, but I've already mentioned two of them, Lebanon and, and Sri Lanka. But there are other countries. You are not going to be easy for you to avoid your name. I will name them when, if I'm asked, but for now I'm not, going to, I'm not going to name them as well. But what is clear and what binds all these countries is that the governments themselves, whether they're middle power countries, whether they're low power, w low um, income countries, what they're not going to escape at all. And what was very clear to us is that the, a number of these countries are running out of options. Um, we see we see more and more economic pressure on them. We see more and more protest, more anger towards the central authorities. We're seeing more violence in response to the fact that governments can't deal with the cost of living crisis, can't deal with the economic pressures, and can't deal with the stresses that a number of them are, are facing as well. Now, Ivan knows us very well. We're very careful in how we make predictions against a number of countries as well. But one of the things that we are, we are, we are seeing also is a, is a willingness and the ease in which governments themselves use repressive tactics to deal with what are essentially um, hunger issues, what are essentially issues around cost of living, what are essentially issues around bread and butter um, challenges as well. And increasingly we're seeing that some states are resilient and others are not resilient to those pressures that they come in, that they've seen as well. Now, one of the things I think that, that should concern us as well is the inability of a number of institutions um, and their ability to respond to those crises as well. Whether it's in Europe, whether it's in the United States, and whether it's in Asia, we're seeing increasingly similar conditions, similar instability arising in unexpected places, especially true, as I said, in Europe, particularly true in the United States, and the inability of a number of countries that we used to rely on ability to respond to those issues as well. The United States was able to avert and help shape the response to the global financial crisis in 2008, and it was able to do that a little bit of that in 2020. Can it continue to play that role is a big question that we're asking ourselves as well. Increasingly also, a number of countries that are looking to, to, look into institutions like the G7 and look into institutions like the EU and the United Nations are blaming those institutions for their inability um, to respond. They're also blaming advanced economies for exacerbating the challenges that they're facing, for tightening their own domestic money um, um, supply to tame inflation, for example, um, which they also suggest is leading um, to, to, to global credit um, crunch. In fact, on the eve of the G7, um, on the G7 summit, Crisis Group issued um, a report to say that if the G7 wanted to maintain its value proposition and if it wanted to be still seen as a relevant institution, that it needed to tilt its position not just away from Ukraine and Russia, but be able to deal with a number of crises and respond to the economic shocks that a number of countries were facing now and, and to show a willingness to the rest of the world that it could respond to their crises and not just limit itself to the crisis that was happening in their borders, in the European um, areas as well. It's partly as a result of that, I think, Ivan, that we saw a number of countries, and you said it very well in your piece in the Foreign, in, f in, the, in, the, in the Financial Times, that we've seen a number of middle-ranking powers, um, countries, um, that traditionally would be, have been defined as emerging economies who are resisting um, the, the efforts to get them to pick and choose a side um, in relation to um, Russia's invasion in Ukraine and are trying to chart a different course for themselves because they don't subscribe to what they've seen so far in relation um, to, 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 to the, to, towards U um, Russia. You've seen a number of these countries try to define an autonomous and an independent um, foreign policy um, for, them, for themselves. And in coming together, while they recognize what is happening in Ukraine, they are saying that as a result of the fallout from Ukraine, we need to also protect ourselves to, to ensure that we are able to survive despite what is happening in Ukraine. 
So what we've seen in the last um, few, um, few, 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 few months is what I would call, and you've called it middle powers, I would call them activist middle powers, influential middle powers. And who are those middle powers, um, Ivan? I would say one of them is Turkey, the other one is Brazil, particularly with the return of President Lula, not under Bolsonaro, but also South Africa and also India themselves. And the Ukraine war has shone a particular light on these influential regional powers and their activism. So for example, it was Turkey um, in its role with the United States, with the United Nations and Europe as well, that would help secure the Black Sea grain deal. And Turkey was playing a very careful balancing act, being a member of NATO, keeping its alliance with Russia, working with Europe, and working with the United Nations to define this new peace agreement to help respond to the food insecurity that was taking place. It was Saudi Arabia, another middle power, um, that used its diplomatic efforts to secure a prisoner exchange um, between um, Moscow and Kyiv. And at the same time, we saw last week, astonishingly, a number of us were surprised that President Zelensky turned up um, at the Arab summit. At the same time, it wasn't lost on a number of us, at the same time where the Arab League was normalizing its relationship with a very close friend of President Putin in the form of um, President Assad as well. And at the same time, we saw the crisis that we saw in South Africa two weeks ago when it was accused by the United States ambassador of potentially allowing South Africa to be used as a base for arms to go um, to Russia as well. These countries, and even India as well, seen as a very close security ally um, to, to the United States and also to Europe, keeping its relationship um, with India, these countries themselves have sought an independent, autonomous path for themselves in defining what international peace and security looks like as a result of the, the invasion in, in Russia. These middle powers existed before Ukraine, but they've become more assertive, more activist, more interventionist, and willing to chart an independent course um, that, is, that, that is in contrast um, to, the United, to the United States, who they still see as an, as an ally, and to the United Nations and to the U European um, um, community as well. And to quote you, um, Ivan, in the, forum, in the Financial Times, you said the insecurities and the ambitions of these middle powers are shaping the emerging geopolitical landscape. So it's not the United States necessarily, or to Paris, or to London, um, that we spend our time doing our advocacy, partly because of the rise of these middle powers, partly because of the way in which they're charting a different path, partly because they don't necessarily subscribe to um, the, the, the rules-based order. They prefer to see a multipolar order, partly because of this we spend a great <coughs> deal of our time trying to understand foreign policy perspective of these countries, trying to understand their position on a number of crises, whether it's Ukraine, um, whether it's um, it Ethiopia, whether it's Syria, or whether it's Lebanon as well. And these middle powers share an, interesting, an interest in charting um, their own independent course as well. And instead of, although they don't necessarily welcome the increased geopolitical hostility, and although they don't necessarily welcome the war that is happening um, in Ukraine, it's also positioned them to be influential powers. Although I remember what you said, Ivan, is that you didn't necessarily see them as change makers globally. You saw them as influencers in their regions. I will slightly differ with you, Ivan, in that I actually do think they're game changers beyond their reason beyond their region, and I'll tell you why. When Chancellor Schultz came to Brazil and asked President Lula for arms, he said no for Ukraine. The same with, 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 um, in, in Colombia, with Petro as well. And that forced President Biden 
to change the manner in which he engaged with both Lula and Petro when they went to Washington. He did not start the conversation on Ukraine. He realized that he had to pivot to deal with their first, what they defined as their security first. And it was env environmental, and it was to do with, 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 with peace and security in Latin America. What was on the agenda of President Petro when he went to the United, to the United States a month ago? It was Venezuela. And it was how to deal also with armed groups, a number of drug cartels in Colombia. And it was about how to bring an end to the crisis in Colombia. And the same with, with, President, with, with, with Prime Minister Modi. And the same with South Africa as well. The South Africa's own instinct was not necessarily to be, is not necessarily to position itself in contrast to the United States, but to say that our foreign policy our own considerations in our backyard is what's driving and shaping our foreign policy. And the same with Saudi Arabia. And in fact, what is interesting about what is taking place in the Gulf region um, today, and it's shaping the way in which institutions are dealing with the Gulf, is that as a result of their own security, as a result of the US appearing to retreat um, from the Gulf region, as a result of efforts to normalize um, and to deal with regional peace and security um, in a post-Trumpian world, they are charting their own course. Hence why we arrived at the, the, the agreement that was shaped by China um, in relation to Iran and Saudi Arabia. But that deal didn't happen because of China. It happened because there was already a conversation in the region about how to deal with Iran, how to deal with tensions that were unfolding um, in, in a region um, also um, with, with Israel as well. And it's in this context that we need to understand the change in geopolitics and that while a lot of us spent a great deal of time looking to Washington, looking to Paris, looking to London to shape international peace and security, what we're noticing in the, in the change in geopolitical landscape is how a number of these issues are now being determined, been shaped, been influenced, been defined by a number of non-traditional players. Non-Western countries are now beginning to increasingly shape and define what the international peace and security looks like. How do we respond to that? What does that mean for the European Union? What does that mean for the United States? It means also that we can no longer be complacent, that we can't treat them as the rest of the world, but we have to begin to have a dialogue, a conversation in terms about the legitimacy of key institutions, but also about their own response and how we work together and cohere around finding solutions to crisis. So for me, when I'm trying to understand a response to Ethiopia, and Sudan is a classic example, it's very clear to us that we can't rely on the same set of actors to help us think through Sudan, but the fate of Sudan has been defined by a number of countries that are different sets of actors, so i.e. the Gulf countries, for example, i.e. the neighbourhood plus the wider region plus the wider international community. And it's a re as, a, as a result of that, I think we can no longer assume that peace and security will be shaped by the United Nations Security Council, or shaped by the European Union. We spend a lot of our time going to Addis Ababa and the African Union. The OSCE also becomes a vital player in terms of how you shape the future landscape as well. The ASEAN countries, for example, in trying to shape Myanmar and also a number of other regional institutions as well. That makes our work a lot harder. The multipolar, the multipolarity, the multi, the multi a multipolarity nature of the international landscape makes our work harder. But it also, I think, makes us realize that the future of the international peace and security requires us to engage with the other side of the conversation, makes us realize that we cannot be blind to the importance of other capitals in shaping the future of peace and security. The big question today, Ivan, and, I, and I'll stop there, is that we have seen in the last few months, a number of peace proposals being put at the table, whether it's a Chinese peace proposal or the, Chi or the Brazilian um, peace proposal or even the idea of mediation 
um, by South Africa. The key question for these countries is not so much that you see yourself as a counterweight um, to Western powers. The key question is whether you as countries yourselves can begin to shape what a peace deal looks like, whether you can find a way in which to influence President Putin to think through an end to the crisis in Ukraine and not just assume that the burden lies on Ukraine um, to find a solution and to come to the negotiating table, but to think as responsible actors in terms of what a political settlement looks like for Russia and for Ukraine that ensures that this doesn't happen again in the future. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much. And because we have a great audience, I really want to go just with two questions before mm -hmm. going to you. And the first is, what you're saying, many people are going to agree, but you cannot imagine what the big change of a policy on the side of both the United States and the European Union it means. Mm -hmm. Because we still live with the idea that the Cold War is over, uh, is back. And because Cold War is back, you start to treat this country as a swing states. And what you're doing on the swing states is you're pressing them. This is how it worked during the Cold War. Mm -hmm. uh, and you're saying you should take side and be sure <laughs> that take the winning one. And uh, I do believe that the most important of this story is that if you're right, and uh, uh, I very much uh, uh, side with you, is they're not going to take sides. Mm. Or they're going to take a different sides in different crises. Because these states are fighting to increase their relevance in the system. Mm. They're not pushing for a new order. They're trying to adjust to this order. And this is a totally different story. So if you go with this type of an argument, then you go to the Brazilians and you're not going to ask for arms, knowing that they're not going to give you arms, but you're going to ask them to commit BRIC countries not to get, give arms to anybody in the Russian-Ukrainian conflicts, mm. which means use them to put pressure on China mm. that they're not going to supply to Russia. And in my view, this is simply different politics. Mm. So this is not simply a kind of a lecture from nothing happening. And in my view, this is, a, for me, the first question is, if this is true, how, and you have been somebody who have been working also on the justice issue, mm -hmm. how this idea of peace and justice then are going to rhyme? Mm. Mm. Uh, if you go on the opinion polls, Ukrainians are very clear. For them, the most important is to get justice for what happened. And th this is everywhere. This is 90% of the people. On the other side, exactly what you said, President Zelensky going and telling the Arab countries how important it is that they cannot be peace without justice, and they're inviting Assad, whom themselves have been excommunicating for a decade, but for whom they blame the United States for not acting and not showing justice, the famous Obama red line, Say, okay, let's talk justice and peace. And my story is how you're basically going to go with the major demand of uh, victims in these conflicts to get justice and this type of a new story in which none of these middle powers are going to use justice discourse. Mm. They can use peace discourse, they can use other discourse, but in their vocabulary, peace and justice <laughs> do not rhyme. So mm -hmm. my story is how you're going to go with this type of a mm -hmm. question, mm -hmm. particularly having public opinion globally more than ever mm -hmm. being at the same time moved by this mm -hmm. kind of a justice mm -hmm. issues. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it really is an, an interesting moment in terms of, and thank you for, for your question. I mean, there, I think there are a number of issues that, that you've raised. First, uh, whether we're in a Cold War moment. I don't think we are. Um, second, also how you reconcile the peace and justice conundrum with realpolitik, by the way, yeah. is what you're talking about. Let, and, then, and then there are a couple of other issues you said about also what it means to have Zelensky and then Assad in, this, in the same room. Let me deal with the, the very first one about the, the Cold War. I don't think we're in a, a sort of a Cold War moment. Um, one of the features about the Cold War moment in relation to some of the countries that I mentioned was that we're not seeing the return of a non-alignment that we saw um, in the Cold War period, that formal bloc 
that 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 proclaimed that it was formally non-aligned um, vis-a-vis um, the Soviet Union and and Russia. Um, neutrality is still very much there, and it's certainly the line um, that the South Africans give. I do I do sometimes wonder um, vis-a-vis South Africa because when you when they the ANC the the and, and South Africans themselves, but particularly the ANC, um, make the argument that the Soviet Union um, was a frontline state and was part of the liberation struggle. And sometimes you have to remind the South Africans that, well, look at the map and see where Ukraine was during the time of the Soviet Union. But more importantly, I think you also have to be honest about who all your frontline states were. Um, there were a number of European countries that were part of the front line. And there were a number of European countries that harboured a number of you that were in the struggle. The Scandinavian countries, particularly Sweden and Norway, which is why historically those countries have had a good relationship um, with them. So sometimes you have to remind South Africa fully about about its history and that shouldn't be, or the ANC fully about its history and not to be selective. But I don't think that we're in a non-aligned with a capital N and an M movement period as well. What is missing today, Ivan, um, in relation to the Cold War period is that we don't have, and if you think the West and Russia is the big problem, I actually think that the real um, geopolitical struggle is between the US and China as well. And what is missing um, that was very much there during the Cold War period was was the hotline. And you saw it played out and used, for example, in relation to the, nu- um, the Cuban Missile Crisis. And I was in Washington at the time of the Bloom Gate, and you saw just how brittle the relationship was between the US and China, and, and how domestic politics then defined and shaped how President Biden responded and also how Xi Jinping um, responded as well. So that's one, one set of issues. Um, the other issue that you, you raised, and I think that one is a more pertinent um, one, um, is around peace and justice. And this is where you do see a dividing line um, between the West and, and the so-called rest of the world or the, or the global powers. And one of our board members said it very, very, very well on the podcast that we do at Crisis Group. You want to talk to me about moral outrage? When I've spent the last 50 years watching how you as some Western powers have undermined the very rules-based order that defined and shaped international peace and security post the the end of the Second World War. You want to lecture me about about standards when you yourselves have used and misabused um, the Chamber of the Security Council at will. You want to lecture me about peace and security? Why is my insecurity, why is my security of less value, or why is the death of civilians in my conflict of less value than yours? Why is the the entire international system being used to focus on what is, at what most people or some people outside of Europe see as a European crisis, and why is the European life seen as more valuable as a, as a civilian who's died in Ethiopia or in Sudan or who's lost their lives in the floods of Pakistan? And it's in this lens, unfortunately, that the tragedy of Ukraine is being negotiated. And it's an unfortunate one. But it says less, it's not about Ukraine, but it's more about that history that relationship between the West and other parts of the world. It's also about the way in which the West has been complacent. And it's also about how historically a number of countries view their relationship with Europe and the United States. And I really want to underline that it's unfortunate that Ukraine and the tragedy of Ukraine is being looked at within that that lens, that Ukraine is carrying the burden, I would say, of 70 years of sort of international politics. It's now under under exposure, but on the the altars of Ukraine. And it's it's a very unfortunate 
I think, for, for Ukraine, that it, that it has to deal with this dilemma and carry this kind of, kind of dilemma. Thank you very much. I'll go directly uh, to, uh, to, uh, uh, to the audience. But I was reminded by a, a beautiful sentence that uh, uh, Kaplan wrote in his new book, The Tragic Mind. He said, geopolitics starts with maps mm. and ends with Shakespeare. Mm. <laughs> Starting with that, but you're ending up with the major moral questions. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to say this because in my view, what is critically important is our discourse on order assumes universal solidarity. Mm. Basically, all conflicts are equally important. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that for the Europeans was so important, how Poland opened its borders mm -hmm. uh, to millions of Ukrainians coming, in the Middle East was basically perceived as a scandal. Mm -hmm. How it happened that people who didn't want 20,000 of Syrians were happened. And in my view, this is also important to understand that geography matters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not all conflicts are going to be equally important for everybody. Mm -hmm. By the way, even in the European Union, you're going to be surprised to see how different is the reactions within the European Eastern Europe itself, mm -hmm. based not on communist period, but from which empire you come. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All the countries that come from the Russian Empire, I mean the Baltics, Poles, they identified with the Ukraine as if this is themselves. And go on the opinion polls and see Bulgarians, Hungarians probably for different reasons, but also Slovaks, Serbia, and you're going to see that the reaction is very different. Mm. Part of it is that we have a kind of a natural borders also of solidarity. Mm -hmm. And if we're regarding this, basically you expect from people more than they can deliver. For sure history comes back, for sure democracy, uh, uh, this type of uh, geography matters. And I'm saying this because probably this is the other story. The world is going to be more regional, but not in the way that simply we're going to have regional orders, but because the very nature of solidarity mm. Mm. is historically and geographically important. The problem is how not to allow this to collapse mm. and this universal framework totally to disappear. Mm. Because the moment it's going to disappear, there is no order at all. Mm. And uh, saying this, please, <laughs> uh, uh, Sergei, I saw already, yeah. The, the one thing I will say, I yeah. Ivan, to uh, align myself with what you just said is that uh, we're pretty clear in an interna in international crisis group. The, wa the Russia's invasion in Ukraine is a fundamental an existential crisis that goes way beyond Europe as well, because it it's also um, involves the potential use of new or the, the the return of nuclear escalation as well. But it's also because you've usurped and undermined one of the most sacred parts of the United Nations Charter. And the reason why it's unfortunate that you see this tension now this so-called West versus the rest, is because I think it also provides a misreading of how some of these countries uh, view Ukraine. A number of these countries um, in the global, the so-called global South were once colonized. They were born out of the United Nations Charter. So for them, it, the principles are not up for debate. The principle of territorial integrity, the principle of sovereignty, is not up for debate. These were countries that were, that were under colonial rule themselves. So they know what it means to be at the receiving end of aggression. They know what it means to be at the receiving end of repression as well. And so whenever they challenge um, international actors uh, or a number of countries on, on that are allied um, against the, the war. They're not doing it against Ukraine at all because they recognize that. And that was borne out in the vote that took place at the General Assembly, the second one, when Russia sought to annex a number of these um, um, regions in Ukraine. Because they understood at that moment, they understood that this was beer-faced aggression and this smacked in the face of everything that they had fought for that led to decolonization. Now, the politics of certain individual countries, I think we need to discuss, and, there, and I've mentioned South Africa, but on these principles, there, there, were, there, were, there was no confusion that this was something that they 
were born from and they understood what was going, going on. And that's why you saw an increase in the vote that took place at the General Assembly in against the annexation that Russia um, moved, uh, against the referendum that led to the, the annexation as well. Yeah, please. Yeah. Please, uh, please, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, I'm just going for the uh, for the audience, just to pr uh, yeah, oh. present yourself and my ideas to get three questions at the mm. same time in order to have more possibility for people. Well, thank you very much indeed for your presentation. Uh, I have a question. I'm actually from Institute of the Danube Region, Central Europe. Uh, however, I would like to take the occasion to ask about Africa. How do you see the situation in Africa now? You have mentioned so South Africa as a mediator. However, the forces from outside Africa are acting. When, you, when we look at, at Mali, at Burkina Faso, uh, at Libya, at uh, lastly uh, Sudan uh, with, with all in connection with the Wagner Group and um, Russia trying to get the base on uh, at the Red Sea uh, in Sudan. Therefore, uh, China being very active in some of the Central African countries, as we know. So how do you see the actual situation? Thank you. Yeah, Sergey, and then... Sergey, you're going to be the third. Oh, the same one. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Should I start from that? Yeah. And after Sergey's question. Yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you so much for this enlightening uh, perspective, uh, because uh, which is often lacking in our discussions, as Ivan noted, in the post-Soviet sphere or in the European Union. But uh, global perspective is very useful, and um, mm, it's very interesting what you said on the uh, non-Western world reaction to whatever this lecture is on law and justice. And I uh, just I have to add, this is precisely what Putin is counting on. That's you know the key point of the Russian propaganda, and they're catering their message very carefully to the non-Western audience. They're putting this in an uh, anti-colonial context. Mm. So this is a very important for them. But uh, I have a question concerning uh, the outcomes of the crisis. Because as you correctly notice, this is not just yet another poly crisis. Mm. Uh, indeed, it is an existential crisis for the West and maybe for the world. Because in the Kremlin, it is seen as a world war. And a parallel to them is not the Cold War, as you discussed here with Ivan, but uh, World War II. Yeah. They really want to change the world order. And it's really, uh, the jury is still out. We don't know how this ends. Mm. And if uh, Ukraine fails, which means NATO fails, which means US and the West fails, mm. we'll have a totally different world order. Well, China might go for Taiwan and, and so on. So the, what we have on the line is the fate of the world. Mm. And in this sense, I want to ask you a question. If we prioritize law and order, re the reinstallment of law and order over the defeat of Russia and the regime change in Russia, don't we look like people who, like in 1942, talk about peace with Hitler? Let's stop the hostilities. Let's stop the war. Let Hitler get away with what he had. You know, Russia up to the Volga, mm. Poland, Eastern Europe, France. But we'll have law and we'll have peace and then we'll uh, just, you know, make peace with Stalin. Mm. So if we prioritize law and order over regime change and a decisive defeat and demilitarization and denuclearization of Russia. So three easy questions. Three, <laughs> three easy questions. <laughs> Let me go back, because you're right, because I didn't answer the, this this question. No, I was I was sitting um, at a at a meeting um, in Stockholm, um, thinking through conflict resolution um, with another organisation, and I saw the picture of Aleppo and Mariupol <laughs> on the television. And it was it was it was a wake up call um, as well um, that you can imagine that what was playing out in President Putin's mind was that okay maybe twelve in twelve years time I too can sort of be free of the isolation I too can be um, be brought in from the cold um, and I too can find a way in which my relationships can be normalized as well. So you could see what was, was playing. But Zelensky also came with a very, very clear message um, as well. I mean, this time last year, the idea that Zelensky would have been invited to the Arab League um, to talk 
um, to be in that company, would, we would not have, have heard of it. We saw him spend more time going to European Parliament and to the United States. Um, th there was an effort to get him to um, talk at the, the Africa Union, that didn't happen. There was an effort to get him to talk in Kenya, that didn't happen in South Africa. Eventually spoke to the, to the chair of the Africa Union as well. So it, was, it wasn't just about um, Assad and the normalization, and I think we have to understand the normalization effort that was taking place vis-a-vis -vis, um, Assad and the Arab leaders within that context. I wouldn't take it out of that context, but there was another message that Zelensky was also reminding um, the world, um, those leaders about, about not to be complacent about their own relationship um, with Russia as well. So there were two important messages, but I would not take out of context what was happening that was specific to the Gulf regions and their own regional insecurities, first around Iran, then around Arab-Israel issues, then around Israel-Iran, um, then around realigning themselves as Gulf countries and trying to rethink their own regional insecurities and also trying to deal with their own insecurities as a result of Syria as well. And then you lay it over um, with Zelensky's important message about what they needed to guard against vis-a-vis um, um, Russia as well. So there were two messages playing out um, at, at, the same, at the same time. I would not necessarily make that, that leap to therefore assume that Putin is watching that and thinking the world would be fine with him coming out at one stage as well. And I also say that in relation to the fact that it was quite bold and brazen of Zelensky to make his message in that room in, a, in the company of a number of leaders that themselves um, have questionable, um, um, questionable foreign policy as well. Um, as for, and I think the real question you were asking was about Russia um, in, Af in Africa within the context of a number of countries and what connects all those countries is the, the news that has been coming out about Wagner and about Russia's own engagement as well. Um, look, the timing um, is interesting. Um, but our message to a number of these countries, whether it's Mali um, in Burkina, where we saw two coups in nine months, and whether it's Sudan, where we've seen a very turbulent transition, um, whether it's in Central Africa Republic, that has, that has depended excessively on international, on external, um, an external military support, is that it doesn't matter who the country is, it doesn't matter what the shape of the military assistance is. You cannot, you, you cannot bomb your way out of a crisis. You cannot resolve the problems which are essentially governance issues by turning to another military ally and assuming that military ally is going to get you out of jail. And that is the message that we've given to, to, to Mali and that's the message that we've given to, to Burkina. And that is a message that we also say to, to Russia that the dilemmas that France faced when it tried a security first approach in the Sahel, and when it tried a security first approach in the, in, in the Central Africa problem, those problems will not differ because it's you. You will find the same problems there because regardless of who, who you are. And it's the same message to those countries who assume that reliance on Russia will get them out. And Russia is not there for some altruistic um, purpose. <laughs> Russia is not there because it, it's an ally of these countries as well. Um, Russia is not there for any other reason, but, but, but it's in search of allies, it's in search of other places where it can play a role. Now, yes, there has been a history of misinformation and disinformation on the continent. Yes, Russia has tried to exploit where France has failed. Yes, Russia is seeking um, other alliances. This is, not, this is not new. This was there during the, the Cold War, War period. But all these countries as well face that same dilemma of how they deal with what is essentially a governance crisis as well. You, you replace Russia with another country and another country. And for so long as you don't deal with the governance crisis in those countries, you're not going to overcome the problem and challenge it. And Russia will face the same problem. China realizes and has had to realize that the political capital that it has expended in a number of these countries hasn't altered the facts that it also needs to find a way in which to ne negotiate um, in these countries as well. 
I mean, Russia, al uh, China also face, faces a dilemma in Zimbabwe, also faces a, a dilemma in, in Sudan. The difference, however, is that China plays the long game. The difference, however, is that China is willing to bet at the bottom dollar as well. The difference is that China is willing to circumvent a number of processes for that, for, for, to play and to get deep into the hinterland. And the West hasn't been ready to play th that, that, that role as well. The other difference also is that the, the what some Western countries haven't realized is that in the last 30 or so years, increasingly, a number of these countries increasingly have choices. Their choices is, not ju is no longer France and the United Kingdom and the United States. They also realize that they can turn to Turkey. Between 2008 and 2013 or thereabouts, Turkey opened 30 embassies. And with every embassy that was opened came Turkish airlines, came Turkish um, businesses, and you're seeing the same with a number of countries as well. You're seeing it with, um, you saw it with India as well. Now, unfortunately for Ukraine, it doesn't have these embassies um, in, in, in Africa. In many uh, African countries, in many Ukrainians African countries. before the war was represented by the Russian embassies. Exactly. Now, President Zelensky, I mean, uh, you know, his leadership, I think, is something to be talked about and to be praised. And he's very big on strategic communications as well. Communicating with a number of African countries, reminding them of, of their own relationships with the, S the Soviet Union, former so Soviet Union, reminding them of where Ukraine was and where a number of them studied in the Soviet Union, it was in the Ukrainian territory, but also being present um, on the continent matters as well. It matters to be there. It matters to be on the ground to talk to Ukraine. There's an interesting, I mean, to talk to a number of African countries as well. It matters to have embassies. The reason why Turkey has become a relevant player is because of its presence on the continent. Diplomacy itself is, 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 is an art and it's a very powerful one. I think that's a lesson also that Ukraine has learned, that it needs to find a way in which to be present in a number of these countries to also, and we have seen certain, we've seen certain changes actually um, take place as well um, by virtue of Ukraine um, being and talking to the region. And, I, and it may sound controversial, Ivan and I, I hope nobody feels offended by what I'm going to say. It matters who your messenger is as well. Ukraine should be its own messenger, <laughs> not Paris, not London, not, not Washington but you yourself should be the messenger of your own crisis and your own solution and your own prescription. Yeah. On this I have, by the way, a very, uh, uh, a very strong argument to support. Do you remember who was the biggest reporter of the decolonization of Africa and Latin America? It was a Polish reporter. Yeah. It was Kapuczynski. Mm -hmm. And if you read his biography, why he was going to all these countries, because he said, I'm colonial subject. Being a Pole, <laughs> I know it very well. Mm. And in all books, this was very much story saying, listen, mm. I know what you're going through because, and this is very important, anti-imperial, uh, uh, anti-colonial sentiment was very important for the founding of the uh, uh, East European states. They were born out of the disintegration of the continental empires be it in the Balkans, basically be in Eastern Europe and others. The problem in my view for part of the non-Western world mm. is very difficult to understand how somebody who is white can be colonized. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this is a real issue which uh, I do believe this is becoming very difficult. A and uh, uh, going to something that Sergei said for me is important. When President Putin started this uh, war, or the last phase of it, on uh, February 24, he really believed it's a special operations. And he always wanted to be a local conflict. And then he lost. And for him, the only way to make it as big and as international mm -hmm. as possible. Mm -hmm because the local mm. conflict is over. Mm. Uh, even if you're basically listening to Mr. Prigozhin in the morning, even he managed to summarize it mm. by denazifying Ukraine. He made, he said, Prigozhin said, Ukraine now is as well known in the world as ancient Greece. 
and secondly by demilitarizing ukraine basically he made the ukrainian army <laughs> one of the strongest army in the world so the only way for him to succeed is he cannot succeed anymore in ukraine he can succeed only globally mm. and this is the paradox of something that happened as a local operation mm -hmm that should have been local and America should stay out. Mm -hmm. And now success means that you should change the world. Mm -hmm. And I do believe this is part of the logic that mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. time to time people are missing. Mm -hmm. It didn't start like this, but it is going to end like yeah, this, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think the big challenge, you know, I, I was talking about inst various institutions and one of the institutions that has sort of um, gained relevance again, it sort of went to the sidelines for a little while, but it seems to have gained relevance again, it's the BRICS. Yeah. Um, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and, and, South, and South Africa was added on. Um, and suddenly, it's not just that they've re-emerged, I think also partly because of the return of Lula as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's not only that the BRICS has returned, but a number of countries now are clamoring to be part of the grips. So you've got Turkey wanting to be part of it, Algeria wanting to be part of it, 19, Egypt, countries. Right, 19 countries wanting to be part of it. Now. I think it's your colleague at the back who raised, I think it's an important yeah. question. Yeah. This mustn't be misconstrued coming from the crisis group as, as suggesting that the rules-based order um, is up for grabs on the contrary. This is not also a defense of, of Russia or the Kremlin. On the contrary, we recognize um, this. I think the challenge is how the West reacts to um, the, this, this sudden sort of um, fluid and changing international um, um, architecture as well. Um, the post-Cold War order, the rules-based um, system, is being called into question. Um, it has shone a light on a number of things that we've always seen that was there. It's shone in a light that the very um, sort of architectures <laughs> of the rules-based order themselves have undermined the very rules um, that they've also undermined the institutions, that they haven't often used the institutions or have, or have misused those institutions. They've, they've undermined the Chamber of the Security Council. We saw that in, in the context of, 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 of Iraq. You yourself mentioned um, the red line and the walking away from the red line from President Obama, you know, and, and, and also the way in which um, international actors and, and key international actors had often not responded to crises that really were a question of peace and ju of peace and justice as well, and that we said never again, for example, in relation to Rwanda, we said never again also to apartheid in South Africa, and those same countries that say, said never again turn a blind eye to a number of crises or never responded in an articulate way even to the Syria. Um, that, you're, that you mentioned as well. Questions around how to bring peace um, into Syria, questions around how to handle a number of these crises that went beyond several um, borders. You mentioned also, um, Ivan, the whole issue um, of, of migration um, here in, in Europe. I mean, a number of these countries watched how their crises were being dealt with within the context of a rules-based order. And so when you, at the moment when you turn to them <laughs> to defend the rules-based order, they're saying, ah, oh, but wait a minute, where were you? Where are you on the, on the question of, of Israel-Palestine? It's a legitimate question that has been asked. No, I'll stop that. No, no, we have time for four questions very quick. <laughs> Let's go there, yeah, everybody, yeah. Oh, please, the first, yeah, uh, please, and then Ambassador Patrick. This yeah. may be out of line, but um, as you're in the business of watching the shaping of crises, uh, is your organization taking a look at Austria? Is, is, sorry, is, is your organization taking a look at Austria? Um, do you want me to answer? <laughs> <laughs> I should come she back. She'll know. She'll know after having two days of meetings next days. <laughs> <laughs> Ambassador mm -hmm. Petrici. <laughs> Thank you very much for a really extraordinary presentation um, to give the big picture of mm. because sometimes we have. Uh, 
too much really just in in our own European and even Austrian, as my uh, friend Alexander has said, uh, issues. But now, uh, if um, you are right, and Ivan has uh, mentioned this, that actually this local war has become now in the eyes of Putin, or he wants it mm. to internationalize, what does this actually mean for an eventual peace and justice deal for Ukraine? Mm. Who are the potential actors in such a obviously internationalized situation now? Mm. Thank you very much. Yeah, the question there and the qu two more questions. Thank you very much. Thanks for a very passionate presentation. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I have a question that's maybe one step removed from what you do. Um, you mentioned Turkey a lot. Uh, I was in Turkey two weeks ago before the election talking about uh, AI and how it can affect elections. And in fact, uh, deep fakes may have affected the, the Turkish election. So my question is, well, we have a Geneva Convention of about the rules of war and conduct of war and so on. But do we need to have something about uh, AI as well? Because we're getting to the point where computers are starting to think for themselves, almost, not quite. And so this seems to me to be a, an issue that's not being addressed and should be, and I'm wondering what your take is. Thanks very much. <laughs> and I'll ask the question, please. Thank you. Congratulations for your work and this uh, lovely presentation and super interesting. I'm going to go to the other side. Um, I just want to know your opinion about the situation, uh, uh, what I call the fentanyl crisis between China, Mexico and United States and the plan of United States that maybe have an intervention in Mexico because government doesn't seem to be really tackling the, the Mexican cartels and they are denying the fentanyl traffic. And I just would like to know your yeah. big picture about it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And you have five minutes, five minutes to answer for <laughs> question. <laughs> Should I give you an answer to this question after I've spoken to the foreign minister and see what he has to say? <laughs> 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 but no, on a serious note, I mean, crisis groups mandate is it's, it's very clear. We deal with, um, with situations of deadly violent conflict. And if you're going to tell me that Austria is at that point, then, then Ivan, you, you failed in your job to send me this warning <laughs> as a <laughs> trustee of crisis group. Um, but no, I don't expect it. But we see, and the reason why I'm here also is that um, Austria has been a long time friend of crisis group. Um, and I believe that the, the government um, supports crisis group because it believes in, the, in, in conflict prevention. Um, it believes in conflict um, mitigation and it believes in conflict resolution as well. So it's partly why Ivan asked me um, to come here and I had the pleasure of also um, in, in my new position, the very first foreign minister that I met at the Munich Security Conference was the, um, was the Austrian um, foreign, foreign minister. F so from that perspective, um, I would say because o Austria is an, is an ally um, that I think we can talk to them about Piece of security, uh, but not about the state of, uh, of developments in, in Austria as well. Um, sorry, I forgot the, the question. The peace. Uh, if we are going to a much more international crisis, who are the peacemakers? Who can yeah. negotiate? Peace? I mean, look, what's been very interesting, I can answer the question in terms of my own, even my own evolution in, in crisis group as well. Um, you know, when I, when I came to crisis group back in um, 2001, and then I went to other places as well, and I came back. It, there was a very clear contrast for me. Um, no longer was my footprint just going to Paris and Washington, um, New York, and, and these traditional centers. I needed to engage with the region. So Abuja, for example, um, neighboring um, Liberia, because I was dealing with the, with the, with the war in, in Sierra Leone. I needed to deal with Addis Ababa, which is the home of, of the Africa Union, the, uh, you know, Africa's own multilateral institutions. I had to go all the way to, to Beijing because China was also a key player in relation to, to Sudan and South Sudan, and also was a political player in Zimbabwe. All of this to say is that the change in nature of the international community is no longer just the Western powers and Western institutions. Um, it's the G20, it's the G... If you, if you agree 
with my analysis that we are at a poly crisis, um, that we've got a cacophony of international issues to deal with, whether it's a global pandemic, whether it's climate security, um, whether it's insecurity, peace and justice, um, whether it's civil wars and violence, then you'll agree that the centers of powers are no longer the same. If you recognize and agree that we are a moment where there's, that there's geopolitical competition, um, and where there are, are, you know, the rise of emerging powers as they economic powers as they were, they were previously called, and you agree that there's a rise in influential um, middle powers, um, and if you also agree that the regions themselves have become um, sort of key architectures in terms of regional peace and security, then you'll realise and you'll agree also that the response to Ukraine requires an, a whole international um, response as well, which is why we say that take seriously, we can debate it, we can scrutinise it, we can criticise it, but take seriously um, the peace proposals that are coming from these other centres and the people that, ha that also have an ear or may appear to have an ear um, to, to, to Russia and to, and to Putin. I, I have question marks over some of these issues, but I think also we need to tell these countries that it's not enough to just put proposals on the table, but you have to be responsible actors in terms of crafting what a peace settlement looks like that safeguards Ukraine's sovereignty, that safeguards Ukraine's territorial integrity as well. So the burden is also on those countries that are criticizing the West, that are criticizing years of double standards of the West, because you also have double standards in your countries as well. Those of you who are criticizing Western countries, we also know what you've done at home as well. It's not as though you're, you are free from some of these things that you are criticizing um, the West for. So you also have to be responsible actors in seeking as a solution. So it requires an, an, a whole international solution. It's not going to be solved by the West alone. It's not going to be solved by the United States alone. And it does require a number of countries who are coming up with proposals to also be responsible in how they see an end that preserves and keeps Ukraine intact as well. You can have oh, on the AI um, question, I, I mean, I, I agree. In fact, Alyssa, my colleague here, um, who um, in fact, if you want to look for a good example of why we no longer just spend our time talking to the West, and this is it, because she was brought in to actually engage directly with us on the African Union and now think about our global advocacy as well. And one of the things that we were discussing also was the rise of Afri um, artificial intelligence and how it can be a, a double-edged sword. It can be both a positive tool if used correctly, but it also has negative um, consequences. What those look like today, I, I cannot tell, but I think we have to look with a degree of caution, be open-eyed about it, understand its potential, but also understand the negative um, effects um, of that, of the instrument as well. Um, as for fentanyl, um, you know, I saw the fallout, I read the fallout um, um, in relation to um, fentanyl and how the US is also wanting to clamp, asking Mexico to clamp down um, on these um, on these various um, cartels. I mean, it's a it's a familiar story also about um, America's own relationship um, with Mexico and trying to find a way in which to deal with um, with the drug trades um, in in Mexico. There was a devastating article in The Economist, I think, last week about America's real crisis and the fentanyl crisis. Um, was was the other one. I don't have an answer um, to this. I, I was fortunate enough to, for the first time in my position um, to to be in Bogota, um, but even last year to be in, in Mexico and to see the change in relationship, but also the, the real insecurity issues um, that Latin America has to grapple with and how the US has to accompany that pro, um, process um, because of its own domestic, or because of the domestic blowback um, to, to the United States as well. Thank you very much. One of the major things that Adam Tuz did when he reintroduced the idea of the poly crisis mm -hmm. was that the most important about poly crisis is that it is more than the sum of all crises. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Secondly, for the first time after 1970s, we do not have one answer. Mm -hmm that can solve all of this crisis. Mm -hmm. And I do believe from this point of view, we're really very much privileged to have you here. And 
Love me to thank you on behalf of you. Thank you.